The world has gone insane. Even if that's not what you've said, it's definitely what you've thought. There's a global pandemic. Right-wing populism is sweeping the West, and totalitarianism is spreading across much of the rest. The US and China, after being adequate partners for so long, are now butting heads by every single metric. Racial looting and rioting in America. It seems like wars are on the verge of happening, and are a collectible item with exchangeable countries like Turkey, Iran, France, the US, China, North Korea, India, Pakistan, etc. The global climbing is getting worse at a rapid pace. For most of us in the West, the world seemed so secure until several years ago and then everything fell apart with little explanation why. So many things went wrong at such a rapid speed that seemed completely unrelated. The truth is that you could have seen the coming crisis if you knew where to look. In my opinion, most of the issues the world is currently facing are due to four root causes. These are things that aren't really under anyone's control that operate over hundreds of years. It's so emotionally satisfying to believe that your one enemy, hopefully with a name with one or two syllables, is the one to blame for all the world's ills. The Jews, the right, the left, Islam, China. Well, in reality, these are all players struggling in a harsh world outside of their control. My background is history. This comes with certain disadvantages when it comes with dealing with the present and future, but it comes with some immense advantages. I'm used to seeing the world over massive periods, and so I can see what makes our era of history special and not so special at the same time. I'm going to try to use the past to explain the present and what direction we're currently headed in. A final thing, you might think these four constellations of reasons makes our era of history special. It doesn't. There are normally many causes for any single thing. With that done, let's move ahead. Before we start, if you're getting tired of how crazy this world is, Try to escape to one with even more bloodshed and horrors. This video was sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, a fun fantasy mobile game. It's a turn-based squad combat game in which you assemble a team of fantasy badasses and crush your enemies in thrilling combat. You get to control many different incredible heroes of different fantasy races. You have to fight the Dark Lord Siroth, and you collect the shards or souls of dead warriors to aid you in your quest. You can collect champion fragments which let you collect pieces of awesome champions with continuous new special events going on. There's an epic 12 level campaign, I just got to say, this game is gorgeous. There's also a market where you can exchange the spoils from battles for high value items, and over the next 270 days you can get new champions by just logging in. There's been a lot of updates this month, and so there's no better time to start than now. Click the link in the description in the next month to get the discount for 100k silver credits and this free champion, the Acolyte, and start playing for free. Click on this info box inside the game for extra rewards. Start fighting epic battles and crushing your enemies today. Reason 1. Population Growth This is the one biggest variable here by far. We've seen an incredible explosion in global population in the last 80 years. The world's population in 1940 was 2.3 billion, while today it's nearing 8 billion. By historic standards, the world's population only passed 1 billion in the 19th century. In the 1960s and 70s, there was immense worry about mass starvation. Many experts predicted that by 2000, the world would be experiencing crippling famines. This was entirely blocked by the Green Revolution and the development of GMOs, which resulted in a skyrocketing of food production, and so the world today is the best fed and richest it's been in all of history by a vast margin. This has been the greatest miracle in human history, feeding four times the population in a couple decades. It would be easy to say the population growth had no effect. As a counterpoint, let me bring up the 1968 novel Stand on Zanzibar by John Brunner, which is a sci-fi novel about what the world would be like in 2010 if it had 7 billion people, as it actually did have. Although we got some things wrong, in this book, America has its first African-American president, President Abomi, with the Soviet Union having also collapsed. China replaces it as America's main rival, and class divisions have grown incredibly in America. 
He also predicted mass shootings, political polarization, powerful multinational companies, dance raves, headphones, video calls, acceptance of bisexuality, and same-sex marriage. What I'm trying to say is that you could have figured out a lot of the present by seeing what effects population growth has in societies. The historian David Hackett Fisher put forth a brilliant theory in his book The Great Wave, which is about four cycles of population growth over 1,000 years of Western European history. One of these was in the High Middle Ages, another in the 16th and 17th centuries, another the late 18th century, and the final one starting in the 20th century. In each of these cycles, as the population went up, you see the same repeating effects in the societies involved. The big variable is that as population goes up, so does competition for resources. The standard of living for the working man goes down. As no government is willing to tell its citizens that they will live worse lives than their parents, every government inflates their currency as much as possible. The economy needs to grow as fast as possible, or everyone individually gets poorer. Inflation always tends to help the wealthy and connected, whose amount of capital allows them to invest in various endeavors and the amount of their income gives them a buffer. Meanwhile, it erases the smaller wages of the working and middle classes, which creates larger class differences. As the class differences grow and people intuitively realize the pie is shrinking, the upper classes use corruption and their influence with the powerful to protect their privileges and politics becomes more corrupt. Real estate prices skyrocket as people invest in real things that won't decline in value over time like money. As the population becomes more desperate, politics becomes more extreme and partisan as centrist candidates aren't solving anything. Traditional culture stops making sense, and so people start to go with more emotional and generally negative cultural and philosophic movements. As the population and thus the governments get more desperate, wars become endemic as governments try to break the rules of the peaceful international order in order to hedge it in their favor. The whole system collapses with some spectacular horrors, which lowers the population and breaks the previous social and administrative system. This has come in the form of the Black Death, the crisis of the 17th century, the Napoleonic Wars, and whatever is occurring in the present. In general, it's not often an issue with actual population. If resources were adequately spread, the world would easily have enough resources, but society, class, government, etc. all manage things in manners that are often far from efficient. For example, 17th century Spain could have dealt with its massive poverty and homelessness by exporting its population to the lightly settled colonies in America, but that went against too many vested interests. What happens most of the time is the previous administrative elite is wiped out and a new, more efficient system replaces it after much bloodshed. This occurred with the Renaissance, in the Age of Exploration, the Enlightenment and Scientific Revolution, and the rise of liberalism and the Industrial Revolution, respectively. However, this may be biased towards Western Europe. The ends of cycles have been far less optimistic in other parts of the world. In Eastern Europe, the new forces that replace the old are often just more repressive, and in China, little is learned from cycle to cycle. Although very few people are starving in the world today, there is struggle due to population growth and resource limitation. We see this in a skyrocketing worldwide prices for real estate. The many water wars that are on the verge of occurring, whether between India and China, or Ethiopia and Egypt, among others, or even the global competition for labor that's led to a decline or stagnation of median standard incomes in the first world. Similarly, in each of these cycles, a triggering climactic shift has tended to trigger the final collapse of the previous system. In the last three Western cycles, that was the Mini Ice Age, entering its harsher faces. The French Revolution, Black Death, and Crisis of the 17th Century were all kickstarted by freezing harvests that left the population decrepit. A similar conclusion could be drawn about global warming, which has already resulted in political instability in the Middle East and the Sahel region. Climate change was likely instrumental in the formation of ISIS, for example. China's damming up of India's river system, including the Ganges, makes climate-caused wars looking especially unpromising in the near future. Another important thing to consider is that a reason the Middle East has been so crazy is that this region has seen some of the greatest population growth in history, while the economy hasn't been able to keep up, which creates a large disaffected young population which just generates instability. Africa, which is currently going through a similar process but a few decades later, will likely have a series of horrifying conflicts in the near future.
I really didn't do this topic justice. There's so much to talk about when it comes to population and why the modern world is the way it is and what direction that's going in. I wanted to get more descriptive about how the cycle is related to the present and the enormous effect aging is going to be having on politics in the future, but alas, I need to keep this video a watchable length. Reason 2. The Decline of Traditional Religion Humans have to believe in something. Purpose is what gives our often unpleasant and miserable lives reason to keep going. For much of the last 2,000 years or so, much of this purpose came in the form of the traditional religions like Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, etc. However, partially due to technological progress, the world wars, and conscious suicide on the part of the intellectual classes, belief in the traditional religions has been getting weaker, which has created an immense power vacuum inside people's hearts. Every different region in the world is having a different ideological struggle, and it's way too complicated to get into every local variation. But for a brief overview, East Asia is in general having an ideological vacuum. The Chinese Communist Party is trying to fill this by artificially creating its own ideology out of various bits pulled from Chinese history, combined with loyalty to them. In the Middle East, we're seeing genuine religious wars, as Islam is unable to come to terms with being outpaced by its older brother Christianity, and the need to basically reform or die. In Europe, this comes mostly in the form of an attack upon the dominant ideology among the elites of welfareism, a term I invented, which basically holds that providing the least hardship to the population is the best policy, and social justice, which needs no explanation, both which are unable to survive in a world with greater competition in that these ideas were founded upon the presuppositions of security and wealth. This attack has been mostly done by the traditional right, whose value system is deeply unclear, but not explicitly Christian. In the United States, where welfareism and social justice never took hold entirely among the elite, they are locked into a spiral with the previous ideologies of Christianity and liberalism. It's easy to underestimate the importance of this struggle, but it effectively takes on every aspect of American culture, with effectively every topic or possible government policy becoming a new front in the culture war. Make no mistake, these various struggles amount to religious wars. Even if those involved avow with their words that their atheists are agnostics, they act with religious devotion and treat the morality of their actions and the destiny of their success with religious fanaticism. Stuff like the dialectic of history or the moral arc of history are basically acts of faith, and in my book, if a cat doesn't say it's a cat, but looks and acts like a cat, it's a cat. This happened before in Eurasia from around 500 BC to 300 AD, when you saw a growing agnosticism and irreligion, well, new religions developed that could fill the void. Once you saw Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, etc. develop, the world fell back to its average state of deep religiosity. What people don't talk about is that there were cults and belief structures that failed and collapsed before those that succeeded showed up. Legalism, the cult of Isis, my buddies Mithraism and Stoicism, Neoplatonism and Manichaeism are all part of that list. I think most of the ideologies that we're dealing with now are going to fall into that category. The main issue is that with the collapse of Nazism and Communism, with liberal capitalism's weaknesses having been painfully shown, while social justice is such an orchid, there really isn't much to believe in. This will likely be reconciled by a wave of new religions in the near future. The issue of most of the recent ideologies, with Marxism or Nazism as prime examples of this, is the desire to put humanity's desires as the guiding hand of morality, and an inability to understand the limits of human nature. In every single regime where morality is being decoupled from an abstract, and whatever is good is in the hands of whatever people say it is, there's always been mass death or complete ineffective apathy. We saw this with the Nazis, Communists, Qin Dynasty China, and Revolutionary France in the first category, while post-war Europe, the Hellenic states after Alexander, and modern Russia are in the second. The reason these ideologies are so popular is they give the classes that lead them, mostly intellectuals, an immense ego boost and source of power since it gives them control of morality, lets them change society how they wish by giving them the reins of control over society. This is why Marxism will continually be popular, 
even though on a factual basis, it's been a complete failure. To survive as a civilization and prevent the errors of the 20th century from repeating, we will have to reconcile abstract morality with our inability to prove God, and thus likely inability to continue to design a philosophic system with him as the center in a world that demands scientific proof for things. This will likely come in many forms, that I will have to make a video on at some point. Islam and America and Protestantism are very adaptable, and I could easily see them reforming in the near future. Other religions that seem far too wacky for to seem realistic now will likely appear in the next century or few. I haven't even touched on the personal stresses involved. Life is hard, and it's much harder without a clear value system to justify all the suffering involved. When the only reason to live is money and sensory pleasure, as many people believe today, when you don't get those things, your life is meaningless. This is the big reason why, on a national level, there is so much unsustainable debt-based economic growth, since few nations really have any values or greater goals to chase rather than money. Number 3. The Dislocations of the Information Revolution In our lifetimes, we've seen one of the greatest technological revolutions ever. I don't need to tell you about it because you've seen it. I personally think that it's for the better, but of course I would. I'm Gen Z, and so I'm dependent on stuff like GPS to get around, and YouTube recommendations for my music, and I run an extremely niche business that could never have existed in any other era. A professional taxi driver who lost his relatively good job due to Uber probably disagrees. This currently reminds me of two eras in history. The first, which was very cleverly shown by historian Neil Ferguson, is Europe after the Gutenberg Press. The rate of growth in the publishing of information has grown in roughly similar proportions after the invention of the internet and the printing press. The invention of the printing press let people with similar ideological views congregate and created new ideologies like Protestantism. People like to think that with greater access to information, people get more tolerant, which isn't true. People in general read what they want to read, and so it lets radicals congregate, which is part of what resulted in the political polarization of the early modern period. A very similar thing is happening online today with people of different political positions. Something else very important that TV started and the internet continued is that it lets people in poorer areas realize how much richer people in other areas are. It used to be that an African peasant would never know how much poorer they were than an average European, or an inhabitant of Rust Belt, Michigan versus Beverly Hills, but now those differences are being rubbed in, creating an unbelievable amount of envy and anger. However, the internet isn't just online, it's affected our physical lives quite a bit at the same time. For example, the advances in robotics have laid off many blue-collar workers. This has created immense social instability. I'm not so worried about this trend lasting much longer. As long as machines would start to replace the jobs of the wealthy and powerful, they will become taboo. I can't see machines replacing lawyers as long as the lawyers write the laws. Also, blue-collar human voters have votes, machines don't. Even the most authoritarian regimes know that a lazy, purposeless, and unemployed population is the worst recipe for social instability. Similarly, machines have broken social ties. I've always lived in the age of technology, but I've gained the impression that social bonds were stronger and more easily manageable before technology. This is backed up by evidence as attendance of all sorts of social groups has declined. We've tried to replace actual social groups with online ones like Facebook, Twitter, or the like. This ignores that humans are inherently social animals, and we've evolved our social functions over millions of years, and so just transplanting one form of social organization completely different from the physical gives few of the same benefits. When you're texting a friend, your brain thinks you're staring at a screen, not talking to a friend. We've all been through quarantine. We all know this is true. Since humans are inherently social creatures, this has created an epidemic of loneliness around the world and anxiety as people lose social networks that would provide them support. I get the impression from my travels and conversations that this varies around the world, with generally the areas that are still trying to compete in the global economy, like East Asia and North America, having this the worst. We see evidence of this all over our culture, between incels, the Japanese shut-ins, most of our music has a generally depressed, lonely vibe now, and so many TV shows at the power of friendship. This is one of those variables that's almost certainly important, but it's impossible to quantify. When an emotion carries millions of enough people, it generally results in greater social irrationality and desperation. 
we will almost certainly develop ways to deal with this in the near future, as future generations will become so integrated into technology as to know its limits when applied to human society. Part 4. The Decline of Western Power I don't know why it's controversial to say the West has been in decline. It's been true by nearly every metric. A hundred years ago, the West controlled nearly all the world, was nearly all the world's economy, and was centuries ahead of anyone else developmentally. However, then the European powers killed each other horrifically in the world wars, while Russia turned it in itself, which meant America was the only Western power remaining. The West decolonized, while America, fearing the Soviets and communism, became a superpower, policing the world's oceans and trade routes for free, and ushering in a golden age of personal freedoms, wealth, and technological progress. A big issue I run into when I try to debate what the future will be like with other people is that they don't understand that this post-World War II golden age is a bizarre aberration. One of the strangest tropes I've found while traveling is the anti-American who's dressed in jeans, listens to American music, criticizes America with phrases invented by American academics, while their country is independent due to America, and often the social system they advocate cannot exist without the American strategic umbrella. However, after the fall of the Soviet Union, there was no international threat to the United States, and ironically enough, the American-led international order resulted in the creation of China a state that could rival America. Although the US has many advantages over China, you just can't get over the fact that in a war, America would have to kill four Chinese for every American to stay even, numbers which you rarely see in the history of war between countries with rough technological parity. Similarly, considering China's current industrial output, it would almost certainly outproduce America in military materiel. In 1996, Sam P. Huntington wrote a book called The Clash of Civilizations, in which he posited that the dominant political struggle in the world in the new millennium would be that between different civilizations. It sounds sort of suspect and abstract, but the amount he predicted correctly with that paradigm is shocking. He predicted China's militarism. Islamic terrorism in the West, crises over immigration, an American alliance with Vietnam and India against China, Iran and North Korea trying to get nuclear weapons while Russia trying to re-expand into Eastern Europe. The really big force now is that America is pulling out of much of the world's politics, since without communism's international threat and America becoming oil independent, it is little reason to police the whole world. Peter Zeehan's book, The Accidental Superpower, is an interesting summary of this. Since World War II, this has basically frozen borders in place, even in areas where they make no sense like Africa or the Middle East. For example, if a wannabe Napoleon seized power in Kenya, started to build up his military and invade his neighbors, America would stop him. This seems to be stopping, now as America pulls back into its strategic self-interests, which is why countries like Turkey, Russia, China, and Iran are now expanding their influence so rapidly in every direction. This is the origin of many of the world's conflicts today, as the U.S. is effectively leaving any area that's not in the First World or in the Americas, and people need to figure out an actual sustainable balance of power. I'm not actually saying the U.S. is a power in decline, merely one retrenching. It seems likely the U.S. is going through an exceptionally painful period of transition and self-examination, as it has several times before. By looking at its position in the world economy, demographics, and technological and social power, the U.S. has been easily holding ground. No matter what, the United States will continue to be an exceptionally powerful country, and a great deal of its power abroad will be determined by America's willingness to go abroad. In summary, a lot of things are causing the current issues. I haven't really given any of these topics any justice, and this really would fit a book format better than a 20-minute video. However, this is what we have. Coronavirus itself is likely a function of population growth, and that populations that grow into the wild encounter wild species that transmit diseases to humans. This occurred with Ebola, the Black Death, Spanish influenza, among others. Globalization, caused by the American strategic umbrella and population growth, which created unhygienic slums around the world, exacerbated the disease. All of the issues involved have been accentuated by coronavirus. I think the perfect encapsulation of many of these variables is the American school shooter. School shootings started due to the decline in American industrial jobs that started as a function of greater international competition that was caused in large part by population growth. 
will at the same time not having any ideology to justify their economic failures, while not having a social network that would support them in their psychological struggles, while the media makes them famous due to the information revolution that just provokes more of them. You can't just blame guns. Americans have always had a lot of them. School shootings are just in the last 40 years. Well, that's it. If you liked that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for future content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, where I've got all sorts of cool maps and my own history of the world. Or alternatively, check out my Twitter. As always, thank you so much for watching and have a great day.